Welcome to the Alain Guillot Podcast, where we speak about personal finance and entrepreneurship. This is episode number 52. Today, we speak with Jonathan Clemens. Jonathan has been thinking and writing about personal finance for about 33 years. 20 of those years, he was working for the Wall Street Journal. Now, today, Jonathan is the founder of the website called Humble Dollar, and he has written a personal finance book, one novel, and he has contributed to five other books. Today, we speak about his latest book, From Here to Financial Happiness, and in particular, we speak about how to squeeze the most happiness out of each dollar. Let's listen to the interview. Jonathan, thank you so much for taking this phone call. It's my pleasure to be with you. Thanks for having me on your podcast. Okay, so here I have in front of me the book, From Here to Financial Happiness, Enrich Your Life in Just 77 Days. And I tell you, if your purpose was to differentiate yourself, you have to see that because this is unlike any other personal finance book I have read. You know, most personal finance books are either how to earn more money, how to save more money, or how to invest your money. But your book, what I find is on how to get the most happiness out of each one of your dollars. And, you know, that I find it was so enlightening. But uh, to get started, I would like to ask you a little bit of personal information about yourself. My listeners perhaps don't know who you are. So can we start by you telling us who are you and what do you do? So I spent the last 33 years writing and thinking about money. For, for 27 of those 33 years, I've been a writer and a financial journalist. I spent the bulk of my career, almost 20 years, at the Wall Street Journal, where I was the newspaper's personal finance columnist. In recent years, I've uh, been running my own website called HumbleDollar.com and doing various books, including my latest, From Here to Financial Happiness. But as my friends will uh, Tease me, I did spend six years on the dark side, which means that I spent six years at Citigroup, where I was director of financial education for the U.S. wealth management business. So I like to think I have a unique perspective. Not only have I worked as a journalist and a writer, but also I have actually worked on Wall Street. So I've seen the financial world from both the inside and from the outside. Fantastic. And can you tell us, is this something that you ever wanted to do, to be a journalist, to write about personal finance, or maybe you stumbled upon this by accident, or maybe you wanted to be something different when you were going to school? Well, after the brief period when I wanted to be an astronaut, <laughs> when I was, uh, I got into my teenage years, I did in fact become fascinated by, uh, by economics. Um, I was a nerdy 16-year-old kid, and I would read everything I could get my hands on about economics. I went to university to study economics. And when I got out, um, I became a financial journalist, initially in London, and then very quickly I moved to New York. I always knew that this was sort of a possibility because my father had been a financial journalist. Uh, he spent the first 10 years of his career as a financial journalist in London. He'd worked for the Financial Times. He'd been city editor for the Glasgow Herald. And his final job as a financial journalist was to be acting city editor for the Daily Telegraph in London. Well, okay, I have to tell you, and this is happened to be a coincidence, I see, but some of my favorite financial journals are the Financial Times from England and the Wall Street Journal. So, yeah, I'm so happy to be talking to you, yes, out of that. But can you tell us a little bit about your years in the Wall Street Journal? Because this is a journal that people admire. It has a great reputation. So can you tell us more or less you, how, what were you doing there and describe in a few sentences your almost 20 years in the Wall Street Journal? So when I arrived in the United States in 1986, I initially worked for Forbes magazine, and I pretty quickly got promoted, and I spent my time writing about mutual funds. And the journal, the Wall Street Journal, needed a mutual funds writer, so I was hired away by the journal, and I spent my first two years at the journal writing about mutual funds. In 1994, the newspaper's managing editor announced that they were going to have three columnists for the news pages. And at the time, this was unusual for the journal. The journal really 
prided itself on keeping opinions out of the news pages. The only place there were opinions was on the editorial page. So I, with some trepidation, raised my hand and said, yes, I would like to have a column. And amazingly enough, at age 31, the journal gave me my own column and I wrote it for the rest of my time at the journal. What happened during the course of writing that column was I very quickly exhausted all the usual financial topics. You know, After a while, you discover that there really isn't much to picking insurance, putting together a portfolio, figuring out what sort of mortgage you ought to have, and so on. So I started to branch off into other areas, and I became fascinated by topics like behavioral finance. I became fascinated by the research on money and happiness, by evolutionary psychology, and so on. And so what those topics allowed me to do was to broaden the scope of the column. And in turn, as I learned more about that, it also also influenced the books that I've written in recent years. Uh, A couple of years ago, I wrote a book called How to Think About Money, and that drew on a lot of the research on money and happiness and behavioral finance and evolutionary psychology and academic literature on human capital. And that has sort of flowed through further into my latest book, From Here to Financial Happiness, which is probably the most practical book that I've written. It really does aim to take readers by the hand and help them figure out what they want from their financial life, where they stand, and what steps they ought to take next. Well, I have to tell you, I have a lot of admiration for your latest book, and it is truly different. I like the conversation that we as readers, we get to have because I noticed that at the end of each chapter, you make a space uh, for us. You ask us questions, and then we, I mean, if we want to participate, if we want to be active readers, then we are tempted to answer those questions and to reflect on whether we, uh, you know, the answers that we are giving are the true answers. You know, we, we are forced more or less to look inside of ourselves to be able to write the right answers in, in, in those questions. So uh, that in itself makes it, this book so much different from the other ones because this one is a true conversation. I really feel like I'm having this conversation with you. And, and yeah, that's the biggest value I'm getting from that book. One of the things that a really good financial advisor, and I'm, I'm not talking about a a broker who's just out to make commissions, or I'm not talking about an insurance agent who's just pushing the products that you know the insurance companies put on the shelf. I'm talking about really good financial advisors. One of the things that they do is they spend a lot of time trying to figure out what it is that their clients want. And it's not obvious. We, know, we all instinctively think that we know what we want, but the reality is often we get it dead wrong. People spend their entire lives you know, pursuing careers that don't make them happy, going out and purchasing material possessions that just end up in their basement and leave them less happy. You know, one of the things that we know from the statistics that is that even as we become richer as a society over time, our level of happiness has not gone up. Money has not bought happiness. And it's not that it can't. It's simply that we spend it incorrectly. So one of the things that I'm trying to do with this book is to get people to really think hard about what they want from their financial life so they pursue the goals that matter most to them. Okay, um, so Jonathan, in doing my research, I noticed that you have written almost, I, I think, eight books uh, with this one, if I did my research correctly. So you are a busy journalist. You are writing about all this. Can you tell us about at the beginning of you, the writer, your first book, what inspired you to get into this new facet of your life? So when I was, uh, just before I turned 19, I, I left boarding school in England and I had taken the Cambridge entrance exam and I'd, I'd got into Cambridge and I had nine months until I needed to be at university. So I, I came home and you know my parents were like, you got nine months. You you need to you need to do something with these nine months. And I had th- three different jobs that I was thinking about taking. I was thinking of getting a teaching job, uh, preferably teaching economics. I was thinking about trying to get a job up on Capitol Hill, working in a senator or a congressman's office. But I also had this interest in journalism, and so I called the local newspaper. Uh, it was a tiny paper. It only came out 
every other week. It had a circulation of around 20,000. And the editor said, sure, come on down. So I went and I worked for the next nine months for this tiny little paper. And it was a great experience. It was a great experience because I was allowed to do all kinds of reporting. I, I wrote about sports. I wrote about education. I wrote about business. I wrote about the local school system. And the people who worked at the newspaper really took me under their wings and taught me how to write. You know, the editor would sit down and go through my copy and correct mistakes and show how I ought to be writing, use short declarative sentences, get to the point, you know, don't waste the reader's time. All of that was invaluable. And that's really what set me up on course to become a financial journalist. I took a, a lot of what I learned at that little newspaper. And when I got to Cambridge, I became editor of the student newspaper there and I transformed the way the Newspaper was produced because I understood, you know, modern techniques of putting together newspapers, having spent nine months at this little paper outside of Washington, D.C., and, and, and it went from there. I got out of Cambridge in, uh, in 1985, and I immediately went to work in London for a specialty finance magazine, and then, as I said before, in 1986, I came to the States. Okay, well, that's, uh, I always like to find out what is the story behind the, the uh, writer, and this is a very nice story. Now, let me ask you, you already know that we have tons of financial books out there. I mean, if you look into Amazons, there are thousands and, th and thousands of financial books. Then you say to yourself, okay, I'm going to write another book from here to financial happiness. What was the thought process that went into your head to decide to write this book? That's a great question because, as we all know, there are tons and tons of books out there on the basics of managing money. If you want to learn how to handle a portfolio, you know, what insurance to buy, what your estate plan should look like, and so on, there are numerous books that will teach you that. You don't even actually have to buy a book. You can go on Google and put in a few keywords and you can find all the information that you need. But simply knowing what to do is not enough. One of the things that's become more and more obvious to me in recent years is that managing money isn't just about having the right knowledge. Managing money is about changing your own behavior. You know, we all know that we should lose weight. We all know that we should exercise regularly. We all know that we shouldn't smoke. We all know that we shouldn't drink too much. And yet plenty of us do these things, right? right? Similarly, when it comes to managing money, we all know that we shouldn't carry credit card debt. We know we should save more money. We know that we should buy a portfolio of index funds and just sit there patiently with it and wait for those long, great long-term returns to arrive. And yet so many of us can't do that. So what we need to do is find ways to change our behavior. And that's why in From Here to Financial Happiness, I try to focus on strategies that help people to change their behavior. And two in particular I would mention. One is if we're going to sacrifice today in order to have a better financial future, we need to visualize that future. We need to be really excited by the prospect of sending our kids to college, of buying that house, of retirement, and what we can do with those retirement years. So we need to visualize that future, make it exciting so that we can sacrifice today and save for the future. Second, it's one thing to say to ourselves, I should save you know, $300 every month. I should sign up for my 401k plan. I should never carry a credit card balance. I should make sure I get a will. All of these things are easy to ignore if we simply say them to ourselves. But if we go through the act of writing them down, which is what I encourage people to do in the book, then those commitments become much more real and we're much more likely to stick with them. Okay, and you know, this is the first question that I had in my mind as soon as, soon as I got the book, is your title, Enrich Your Life in Just 77 Days. Now, after some research, I found the answer, but uh, maybe some of the listeners will be asking, why 77 days? So the honest answer, and you may already know this, is because when I sat down to outline the book, I got through all of the days and I got to 78 
And anybody who's spent any time in journalism knows that 78 is not a great number. It's a somewhat deflating, generally odd numbers are much more likely to grab our attention than even numbers. So I, what I did was I compressed two of the days into one so I could get this nice, catchy, even number, which was 77 days. So yes, that is why it ended up at 77 days and not 78. Okay. Um, listen, Jonathan, one of the things that make us happy or unhappy is when we compare ourselves to others. So, uh, you know, we live in North America. I say that we are part of the 1% globally. I mean, we, we can just flip a switch and we have light. We can just go to the bathroom and flush the toilet and we have water, you know? So when we compare ourselves with someone in practically anywhere else in the world, we are so much better off. We have shoes, we have brand clothing and all this and that. Yet we compare ourselves with people who are a lot richer than we are in economically knowing or not or ignoring that we are so much much better than everybody else. So uh, maybe can we talk about this constant comparison that we have and comparing our incomes with other people and that happiness or unhappiness that cr that creates in our mind? Yeah, what you're talking about here is what's called the Easterland Paradox, which is named after uh, the economist Richard Easterland. In 1974, he formulated the Eastern, Easterland Paradox, which is this. Over time, even as our income has increased, our level of happiness has not increased. And yet within society, those who have more money tend to be happier than those with less money. So why is it that, you know, if I today have as much money as somebody who was super rich 50 years ago, why aren't I as happy as that person who was super rich 50 years ago? And the reason is the one that you've, you've given, which is that we tend to compare ourselves to those around us. And if we're not at the top of the income threshold, if we're not you know, among the wealthiest in society, we look at our situation, we feel a little bit shortchanged, and we don't report this very high level of happiness. So what are you going to do about that? How are you going to get out of this comparison Mode. Well, one of the tricks you mentioned is you could compare yourself to other people on the globe, but I'm, I'm not sure that that's really effective when, you're, when your neighbors turn out to be wealthier. But there are some things you can do. One is you can make sure that you don't end up in situations where you feel relatively poor. That means you shouldn't move to a neighborhood where everybody else is going to be richer than you. You shouldn't go to stores where you feel like you can't afford anything that's on the shelf. You shouldn't go to restaurants where it's so expensive that you could barely pay the bill when it arrives. All of those situations are going to make you feel poor and hence make you feel unhappy. Second, you should think about how you spend your money. So one of the things that people do all the time is they buy material goods because they believe those material possessions will bring them lasting happiness. But more often than not, those material possessions, we adjust to them very quickly. We get used to them. They break. They end up in the basement. And we're, we're unhappy about them. They don't bring the lasting happiness that we expected. By contrast, if we spend our dollars on experiences rather than possessions. We tend to get greater happiness out of the dollars that we spend. So if you have a choice, you know, buy a new car or take the entire family to Paris, if you're thinking about your happiness, taking the entire family to Paris is going to be a better bet than buying that new car. Well, yeah, that's right. Last year I went to Iceland and wow, I don't stop speaking about my trip to Iceland and I continue showing those photographs to people and when, anytime someone tells me, oh, I don't know what to do about vacation, right away I flash my photograph about Iceland and that has a lasting happiness that, you know, it goes on for years and years and I rather uh, live with less right here in my apartment than to 
take erase those memories of my head and out of my Instagram or whatever newsfeed that I can use to share it. So yeah, I, I, I agree with you. Experiences and, and most of the people know this. Experiences are more valuable than actual physical stuff. Yet we are bombarded every day, you know, buy this brand of car and get the bigger house and our bank is showing us money uh, every day you know get your latest um, credit card or, or you get some more money from your mortgage etc so it's a constant battle that we are fighting every day we know we many of us we know better we know that having a simple simpler life and investing in experiences will provide us more happiness yet we have to fight against this constant bomb bombarding of the retailers and all these financial institutions pushing money in, a, in our bank account. That's true, though one of the great things about spending money is we do it all the time. So even though young adults in their 20s and their 30s tend to focus on acquiring material possessions, by the time you get into your 40s and your 50s and your 60s, gone through decades and decades of buying material possessions and being disappointed by them. And eventually we learn that lesson. You know, one of the things that you find if you talk to people who are older is they're much smarter about how they spend their money than people who are younger. And that's because they've learned from these repeated disappointments. So my mother, who will be turning 80 next year, is much smarter in the way she spends her money today than she was 50 years ago. For her 80th birthday, she's not going to go out and buy herself a new car. For her 80th birthday, she's going to pay for everybody to come together for a family reunion, and she's going to foot the bill for it because she knows it's going to be a great experience, and not only going to be a great experience, it's going to be a great experience shared with friends and family. She has learned that lesson over the years. The trick or the hope is that we realize earlier rather than later so that we start to spend our money in a wise fashion starting from a relatively young age. I know I wasn't that smart about how I spent my money in my 20s. I like to think I'm much smarter today. I remember when I was in my 20s, I invested my whole paycheck on buying a fancy stereo for my car and that's and i would spend all that money buying woofers subwoofers making holes so i can make bigger speakers and you know <laughs> it, it was funny i spent that, all that much money on on that and yet the funnest memories is when i was hanging out with the friends in the park just sitting down and having a beer so, yeah, you, you are totally right. Let me ask you, um, day number three, dream a little. Can you talk a little bit more about that uh, chapter in your book? Yeah, I think one of the things that uh, if we're going to sp spend our money properly, we need to think hard about what sort of financial future we want. And so a key question to ask yourself is, if money were not an object, what would you change about your life? Would you quit your job? Would you pursue a new career? Would you retire? What would you buy? Would you move? If you start thinking about the financial life that you really want and think about it not just today but over time, you can start to formulate what it is that you really want. And as I mentioned earlier, you're not going to know it immediately. You're instinctually not going to know what you want from your financial life. But if you th think about it, you write it down, you go back and you look at what you earlier wrote, you revise it, eventually you will formulate a plan for what you really want to do with your money. And then, and then you can figure out how to get there. Now, obviously, there are certain financial dreams that are always going to be beyond us. You are not going to be able to buy a 200-foot yacht. Unless, <laughs> unless you're a Silicon Valley billionaire. But you know, if you really want to spend your time sailing, maybe you can arrange your life so that you can be out on the ocean or out on a lake. But first, before you pursue those dreams, make sure that those are really the dreams that you care about. Okay, so here's a big paradox, uh, Jonathan. Um, when I speak to people who have money, who are over a million dollars net worth, the one thing that they tell me constantly is that 
money is not that important and that money is not the main thing that you need to be happy, okay? But this is a paradox that I see coming from a mouth of someone who has over a million dollar net worth and they already find out that and they can put aside that. They can perhaps put a check mark in their to-do list and then go on to uh, find happiness somewhere else because they didn't find it in money. Now, as for myself, I had to build a substantial amount of, uh, I call it an emergency fund of uh, several years in order for me to say, okay, money is not that important for me. And now I'm going to focus on things that really truly make me happy. And it turns out that the things that truly make me happy, I didn't need all that money that I have now in my savings account to achieve it, to do them. Like, for example, I love photography. I love, I'm a tango teacher and I love teaching tango. And, you know, I really didn't need that amount of money in my bank account to do the things that I'm doing now that I'm just just 100% focusing on my happiness. But it took me, for me to have that amount of money in my bank account, to realize that money is not the answer. In fact, that I don't even need it to be happy. So I find that it's a, it's a paradox that only after you achieve that, having some money in your bank account, then you can focus on that happiness. And it will be nice to kind of isolate that need of, of, of a cushion and just focus on being happy. There was a study came out about 10 years ago that looked at happiness and broke it down into three component parts. And so what the research has found was that roughly half of your happiness level depends on what they call your happiness set point. I mean, the fact is that some of us are happier than others. And so that happiness set point probably accounts for half of your happiness level. And essentially, you know, some people are just always going to be happier than others just because of genetics. It's just the way they're made. Then another 10 percent is what's called situational. And that will depend on how much money you have in the bank, on how high your income is, on you know, whether you're married or divorced or you have a disability or you have to look after an elderly parent. Those are situational things account for about 10 percent of your happiness. So that leaves 40 percent and 40 that remaining 40 percent is really up to the choices that we make. And if you're smart about the choices you make, then you can achieve a much higher level of happiness. So what counts as a smart choice? Well, I think having money in the bank actually is a smart choice because we know that worrying about money can make people deeply unhappy. So just having money in the bank and not having credit card debt can indeed make you happy. Choosing to spend your dollars on experiences rather than possessions, that will make you happy. Spending time with friends and family rather than sitting at home will make you happy. Choosing to spend your free time engaged in activities that you love rather than sitting at the ca- on the couch at home watching TV, that will make you happy. All of these choices that we make can affect 40% of our happiness level. Our happiness level really is under our control and it isn't driven primarily by how much we have relative to other people or how much our income is compared to those around us. It really is up to these voluntary choices that we make every day. Okay, yeah, that falls in line with what you wrote on day number 22, which says, sometimes we don't use money to make ourselves happy. Rather, we use it to fend off unhappiness. So I guess once you have fend off unhappiness, you have the doors open to find happiness in the things that you enjoy in life. Yeah, I do think that uh, it is uh, worth bearing in mind that people do things that to fend off unhappiness. So uh, what a, a common trait uh, you find among people is that, you know, if they're unhappy, they do something to bring themselves short-term comfort. And so one thing people will do when they've had a bad day is they will go out and go shopping. And so they, they spend money that they probably shouldn't spend simply to give their spirits a temporary boost. Similarly, you know, people will go out and eat too much because they feel unhappy or they'll go out and drink too much because they feel unhappy. 
it's part of this basic dilemma that we confront every day, which is, you know, there's our current self and there's our future self. And all too often we ride to the rescue of our future self, our current self. We do things to make our current self happy that ends up hurting our future self. So somehow we need to balance those two and keep our future self in mind and not do things today that end up hurting our financial future or hurting our future self in other ways by, by eating too much, by not exercising, by drinking too much. Well, I have one more question about the book and uh, I just couldn't figure out the answer of this one. So I noticed at the end of each chapter, you have like a little box and that you have like a two or three lines paragraph. And sometimes it's in relationship with the whole chapter. Sometimes it's not. And can you tell us what were you thinking when you were writing these little boxes at the end of each chapter? So at the end of each chapter, there are, there is that little box and it's normally one or two sentences that is either meant to be humorous or it's meant to make a particular point, those insights actually come from my Twitter feed. Every day on Twitter, I put out a thought of the day or what I call an insight. And I've been doing that now for a couple of years. I went through all of the insights that I put together and I, I plucked what I felt were some of the better ones and I put them into the book. They generally re have some vague relation to the topic discussed in that on that particular day but as you suggest it's not always a, a very direct link so some of them may be a little bit off target okay yes i follow you on twitter and i didn't make that relationship okay great jonathan we are approaching the end of the um, the podcast i always have some some questions that i ask at the end and one of them is can you recommend a book uh, other than you own, of course, that maybe uh, you would like to share with the listeners? And it doesn't have to be about finance. It could be, but just in general, something that you think it deserves for us to look at. Well, I'll be predictable and I will go for a finance book. Uh, one of the books I read very early on um, in my career as a financial journalist uh, was Winning the Losers Game by Charlie Ellis. It short book. It's actually gone through multiple editions. The first time I read it, the first edition I read, it was only 99 pages, I believe. The book has got a little longer in subsequent years as Charlie has fleshed out the book. But for somebody who wants to get a handle on the financial markets, on how to invest, winning the loser's game is really a delightful read. I, uh, I have the good fortune to have come to, kn to know Charlie. He lives up in uh, New Haven, Connecticut, which is where my, my son is is getting his PhD. He's at Yale right now. So when I go up and visit my son, I'll often stop by and have lunch with Charlie. He really is. He's 80 years old now, and he's a, really a super guy. And if you want to get started as an investor, reading Winning the Losers Game by Charles Ellis is really worth doing. Okay, thank you very much. Now, uh, how about a resource? Can you tell us a, a resource that maybe we should check out? It could be a, a podcast, a blog, or a YouTube channel. So if you go on YouTube, search for Terence O'Dean. Terry O'Dean is a finance professor at the University of California at Berkeley. He's one of the leading lights when it comes to behavioral finance. Terry has put together a series of videos on YouTube designed to help people get smarter about money. They're superbly done. There's, he put tons of thought into them. And I really feel that they deserve to be discovered. They haven't been viewed nearly enough. I think they're absolutely wonderful. So if you have a few minutes to spare and you're cruising YouTube, search for Terence O'Dean and look up his, uh, his YouTube videos. They're really excellent. Okay, and uh, Jonathan, is there something that maybe I could have neglected to ask you while I still have you here on the line? Anything, maybe an idea that maybe you wanted to uh, go uh, share and I didn't ask you about? Well, just one final thought, which is that if you're trying to figure out your financial situation and what you should be doing next, talk to friends and family and talk to them honestly. I feel that we don't have nearly enough honest conversations about money. Now, when I was growing up, there were four conversations that you weren't meant to talk about 
impolite company. You weren't meant to talk about politics, about religion, about sex, or about money. You know, we are at this point in society where we talk about everything except money. Money is the one thing that people very rarely talk about in an honest fashion. Show somebody your portfolio. Tell them what your salary is. Talk about your financial worries. If you're thinking about making a major change to your portfolio, discuss it with a colleague. It's amazing what happens when you force yourself to articulate what's going on in your financial life. And sometimes just in articulating it to others, you'll realize how foolish you're being, how silly your worries are, what the answer obviously is. Simply putting it into words is so powerful. You know, I first of all, I agree with you. And secondly, I think this is one of the biggest trap that we have as consumer, because since we don't speak about money, we would like to give the impression that we have lots of it. And that's why we buy houses that we cannot afford. Even if we cannot afford it, we would like to show that we can afford it. And that's why we buy brand label clothing. You know, it's the same shirt whether it has a label or not. But if it has this label, it costs us more money. So it gives the impression that we have more money. So we don't talk about money, but we would like to give that impression that we are okay, that we are, you know, we have plenty of it in the bank account. And if we were to share more our ideas and, and our money reality, I think people wouldn't fall so much into that trap. I totally agree with you. There's so much about money that involves signaling where we're trying to send messages to others about our financial condition to tell them that others that we are financially successful, that we are in good financial shape. But the reality is the truly wealthy in our society are the millionaires next door. They're the people who aren't signaling to others that they're wealthy. They're the couple who drive the secondhand car, who live in the modest house, who don't wear designer clothes. And the reason they're rich is because they're not spending money on all of these things that aren't delivering happiness. They aren't signaling to others that they are rich. The Millionaire Next Door, that great book, really is true. Those are the people who have money in this society. You know, if you want to amass a decent-sized nest egg, you know, the secret to financial success is no, no secret at all. All you have to do is have great savings habits. Great. Uh, Jonathan, can you tell us where can the listeners find out more about you, your website, your books in Amazon or whatever is sold, your Twitter handle, er everything. I think I think you are a person who deserves to be followed. As you mentioned, you quotes in Twitter. You I didn't make the relationship, but I do like following you in Twitter. So tell us where to find everything about you. So I run a website called HumbleDollar.com. At HumbleDollar.com carries five or six blogs every week. Uh, on the homepage, I have a rotating, ta rotating tapestry of different financial insights. Within HumbleDollar.com, I have a comprehensive uh, financial guide that probably runs 500 web pages. Uh, in addition to regularly updating that site, I am active on Twitter. My handle for Twitter is at Clements Money. Uh, you can also follow me on Facebook at Jonathan Clements Money Guide. I'm posting on Facebook every day. And if you want to get my newsletter, my free new newsletter, which comes out twice a month, you can go to HumbleDollar.com and sign up there. Jonathan, thank you so much for spending this time with us. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for having me on. Well, thank you, Jonathan, for spending that time with us. That was amazing. I feel that in many of our past episodes, I have focused a little bit too much on how to earn an extra percent on our investments, on how to save a few more dollars from our day-to-day -day life. But in this episode, we focus on happiness and the kind of happiness that we can expect from our investments. And after all, what is it that we want money for? We don't want money just to keep a store in a bank. We want money in order to afford the kind of lifestyle that we think will make us happy. And today we focus just on that, on how to be happy, on how to get the most happiness out of each one of those dollars. So one more 
more time, Jonathan. Thank you so much for spending that time with us. Now, moving on to other subjects, I have a whole list of people that I want to thank for the support. I think the last episode with Samantha Shorky, we spoke about uh, life as a vegan and financial challenges for a vegan person. Anyway, so I have many comments and many shout outs, many hellos. So I just want to mention quickly the person who has gotten in touch with me. Thank you, Ella G. Boss, Grace Kelly, Ellie Haber, Leticia Avile, Asan Khan, Dumindra, Raya, Cheryl, and Ali. Raya, in particular, he told me that I should be more conversational, that I should chip in and talk more. Um, Sherry, Cheryl is a big admirer of Samantha Shorty, so she was very happy to have her in the show. Thank you, guys, so much for your support. And for the rest of you, I would like to ask you one more time to connect with me. There are so many ways you can connect with me via Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Google+, Plus, YouTube, or Instagram. I'm in all those platforms. And all I want from you is for you to come over and say hello and tell me that you listen to the podcast. I like to know who you are. I like to establish that relationship. And yeah, most of these people who gave me a shout out, they know me personally, but I would like to get to know some of those people who are not in my immediate circle of friends. And wow, this is episode number 52. I made a commitment this year to record an episode every week. And so far, we have been successful. Thank you so much for your support and talk to you next week. <music>